I just did that. I think I did pretty good. I think I got this. I think I killed it! I killed it! I think so. Ah! Ah! <laughs> It's funny that two years ago, I didn't even know what the Fulbright Scholarship was. Little did I know that very soon I was going to become so narrowly focused and obsessed and consumed about achieving one thing, and that was to get the scholarship of a lifetime. So the Fulbright Scholarship is one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious scholarships out there in the world. Just to give you a bit of history, the Fulbright Scholarship was established after World War II by Senator James William Fulbright. And his goal was to use a surplus war material and use that money to fund this scholarly, educational, cultural exchange program. I'm very prejudiced, Mr. Lesser. I think it is the most effective way to bring about better understandings and better relations among the various countries involved. I think that you, um, you have a much better understanding of another country by going there and living among them than you do uh, listening to their propaganda or reading about them. The first time I heard about the Fulbright Scholarship was from our pro vice chancellor, James Avantakis. He sent around a newsletter and in it, it was inviting the postgraduate students at Western Sydney U to check out this information session on the Fulbright Scholarship. So I decided to attend the session, not knowing if I was going to be an ideal fit for the program. One concern that I had was that I only had one publication at the time coming out of my masters. And so I didn't know if, if that was going to disadvantage me. But as I listened to the session, I realized the Fulbright was looking for people that were more than just hardcore scientists or researchers who had 50 different applica uh, publications. What they were looking for were leaders. What they were looking for were passionate educators, people who were innovative thinkers and people who could be great ambassadors for the, for the brand. I remember leaving that session and thinking, okay, I think I'm the ideal fit for this. <laughs> for this scholarship. I know that seems a little bit cocky, but up to that point, I'd, I'd been for the past seven years cultivating a personality or a character that I thought would be the ideal fit for the Fulbright scholarship, for the Fulbright brand. I think a bid was a great fit because with scholarships like this, they're looking for someone with a vision, someone who's a leader, someone who's passionate, somebody who's going to take the scholarship money and actually achieve something. Yeah, I think Hamid's a, a very critical thinker. He's got some interesting ideas. Science communication is a, is a big thing to him. I think that in sort of ambassadorship, certainly the role that he plays uh, at the university certainly fulfills that. But above all of that, he's not intimidating at all. Like, he's achieved so much but he's, as I said before, he's very humble. Like he's always up for a chat, he's always up for a laugh. Um, he's friends with everyone and he's always trying to mediate things, you know, so I think that's important as well so that you don't lose yourself in your success, um, but stay grounded and that's definitely something that I can see with him in every single day, like despite how far he's come. For me, the Fulbright was this golden ticket to work with some of the best minds and the best scientists in my field and to get that leg up and set myself up as an early career researcher. This isn't a story where I apply for something and I chase my goals and I'm successful the first time. This story takes two years to come to fruition. As you would expect, the Fulbright is very competitive. There are two different stages. The first stage is the written application process and in that I had to write a one-page personal statement, basically my narrative arguing why I was the ideal fit for the Fulbright and a three-page project statement which detailed what my project, the project I was proposing, why America was important, why this particular lab that I was interested in, what sort of impact I was going to have on the field, on my community, how my project was going to facilitate bilateral partnership between America and Australia. So it's, they really want you to 
answer all of these questions and make sure that you, you have a project that would benefit the, the program and Australia and the field and that you are worthy investment. The third part was the CV and again this had to again, tell my story and, and tell the story of how my experiences as an educator, as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor, as a researcher, as someone who runs a podcast and is passionate about science communication, how all these different experiences have instilled in me the qualities and the values and how they align to the Fulbright. Whenever we try to tackle these big challenges and set goals like, oh, I'm going to achieve the Fulbright, there's always going to be an incredible amount of self doubt and dread and anxiety because I've never done anything like that. And so to overcome that, I, I, I did two things. Number one, I made the outcome certain in my own mind. I would visualize myself putting a great application together and I'd visualize myself getting the Fulbright scholarship. I embodied someone who believed that they could get this. Obviously, just believing it and visualizing isn't enough. What you have to do is Put the work in and as I began working towards the Fulbright application my confidence grew and my, my doubt slowly began to evaporate. Something that I love doing is looking at my first draft and comparing it to the last draft. I love seeing the progression you know the first draft is always the crappiest but as I draft and redraft and redraft and redraft and redraft I get to about draft 10 when I feel comfortable comfortable about sharing it with my friends so I might get Alex to take a look. Hamid gave me countless drafts. Um, my role was to read them and tear them to bits <laughs> and, and find things wrong in like as many sentences as I could. Yeah. I enjoy doing that. About 15 drafts in I feel comfortable giving it to my supervisor who then gives me feedback and then I make the adjustments and then I draft and redraft and redraft and redraft and about 20 drafts is that sweet spot. It's the point where I feel like my application is, if not perfect, very close to perfection. So at this point, I've put in maybe over 100, 110 hours worth of work. That's about five, six hours every single day for over a month. So I feel supremely confident that I'm going to get an interview, even though I've I've never done anything like this before, but the work that I've put in is giving me that confidence. I think Hamid's approach to the application was spot on. Uh, if you really want something like a job interview or a scholarship or, um, or a PhD scholarship, you've really got to put everything into being explicit and really like throw everything at it to get it. Um, if, you put in a, if you put in a mediocre effort, you might as well put in no effort. The submission date is mid-July and I expect to hear some six weeks later, early September, late August. It's a Friday afternoon, I've just finished teaching metabolism at second year biochemistry unit and um, I receive a phone call and it's a number that I don't actually recognize but it's from Sydney so I pick up and she's like, well congratulations, I mean this is from the Fulbright Commission and I just want to tell you that uh, you've made it to the top 15. There's an interview uh, on the 14th. Would, would you like to attend? And I was like, uh, of course I'd like to attend. At this point, my, my mind is just going because <laughs> all that work that I put in up to this point is just validated that there is no difference. We're all equal. What separates us is just the amount of work and effort we're, a we're able to put in and we're willing to put in towards our goals. But with that excitement also came again that familiar feeling of anxiety, dread and doubt. Never in my life have I actually sat down in front of 10 people to be interviewed. I've never done a panel interview. I've only gone for two job interviews in my whole life. So I'm like severely under practice. So what I do is what every smart person will do when they don't know what to do and that is to go on Google and ask for help. Fulbright interview questions. And I go and I look at different blogs and I see and I read the experiences of people who were successful and unsuccessful in their Fulbright interview. And I copy and paste all the questions that people have reported that they were asked and I begin writing down my responses. I rehearse in front of a mirror and I keep rehearsing, rehearsing until I feel confident enough 
to do it in front of my friends. I wanted to recreate every aspect of the interview. I wanted to recreate going in into the interview, shaking hands with people, um, sitting down and rehearsing my answers, looking at the inter interviewee, the panel members one at a time and making sure that I address all of them. I printed out the pictures of the panel members and I stuck them uh, on the wall and I would walk in and I would um, walk around and say, hey, my name's Samir, great, n nice to meet you, so and so, and uh, just keep doing that until I felt really comfortable. And then I would sit down and I had a, a different layer of a different height, like sitting height um, of, of all these pictures. And, um, and, I, and I'd practice saying my answers to them. And once I felt confident then, then I, would, I, I started recruiting my friends and, and my teachers at, at uni. I did maybe about 15 or 17 mock interviews in preparation for the real interview. And it was really cool seeing myself go from really nervous and not so confident and stuttering at the beginning to like someone who was very comfortable and confident being interviewed by different people. And the feedback that I received from my friends were um, really helpful in sharpening my responses and keeping them focused. Now with all that practice and with all that effort, I anticipated myself feeling calm and collected and feeling like at peace. But the morning of the interview was a Monday morning. I woke up feeling just anxiety and anxious energy running through my body, just butterflies in my stomach. And I was, I was trying to meditate and try to get myself in a good spot. And, and I was rehearsing in my mind. But I, no matter what I did, nothing helped. And I started worrying, wait, what if I'm not ready? If I was ready, then I wouldn't be feeling these sensations in my body. That, that really scared me. But luckily, w whenever you have moments of doubt like that, it's always good getting validation from your friends, particularly one that you respect their intellect and, and judgment. And so I, I asked Alex, I was like, hey dude, like I'm, I'm kind of nervous here, can we do another mock interview? And he ran through the questions and I gave my responses and he's like, Hamid. Just relax, you're prepared, you're, you're, you've got everything down. If you just take a step back and listen, you'll be fine. And it's really funny how much that affected me. I was just calm after that, I was just peaceful. And I headed towards the city, towards UTS, smashed a can of mother for that motherly support. Went into that interview feeling confident that I was gonna do a great job. I leave the interview feeling quite proud of myself because I felt like I executed what I visualized, what I planned for, and my mind and body behaved as I had conditioned it to behave for the past month. Some two weeks later, I'm sitting there at my desk and I get an email from the Fulbright Commission. I'm excited because I expect to get the scholarship. But when I open the email, it reads, Dear Hamid, I write with sincere regret to inform you that your application, although meritorious, was not successful. And my heart just sank because I was, I was hoping to get some sort of news about the Fulbright, but I was not expecting that negative news. So what, what had happened was that one of the first couple of questions they asked me, you know, tell me about your project. I spent about talking about my PhD project and the project that I aim to do in the US. But then I, what I thought would distinguish, distinguish me ended up disadvantaging me. I wanted to showcase to them that I wasn't just this person who has an interesting project in science and will do this interesting work when I go to the US, but I'm actually also this person who is diverse in my interests and I, and I have lab coats. I have this platform where we translate knowledge and research to the broader community. To them, it looked like I was unfocused, that I didn't have a clear goal that I wasn't sure if I was going to do this lab coast thing or if I was going to do the science thing. There was no thread connecting these two together and I just, I blew it. I remember sitting in the car and feeling really sad about not securing the scholarship. He was pretty depressed. <laughs> it's a lot of work, so it's understandable. You put in that much effort to apply for something and that much practice and then you hear you don't get it anyone's going to be pretty let down about that. 
In moments where things don't go right, in moments where I fall face first flat on the ground and I fail hard like this, most people I think would be brutal to themselves, they would criticize themselves, they would um, let doubt come up and give that space to doubt and that energy to those doubtful and, and negative and hateful thoughts. Whereas I am very compassionate to myself. In that moment, I reminded myself that, hey, Hamid, you just weren't ready this year. And that next year you're gonna do it better because you've learned the lessons from this year. And, and I'm really proud of being able to do that because had I smashed myself there, had I really be, uh, laid into myself there, I think I wouldn't have had the confidence to, to try that again. So 2019 rolls around and I am both excited, anxious, full of dread, a bit doubtful, but I know I have to get the Fulbright Scholarship. I failed once and I wasn't going to let it happen again. All the lessons that I learned from last year to secure the scholarship for this year. Now there are a few milestones that I had to accomplish. Number one, I had to find a lab, uh, a collaborator that I could work with, someone that would be pivotal for my early career success when I, when I finish my PhD. Number two was to finish the written application. Number three was to prepare for the, for the interview. Out of these three, number one scared me the most and gave me the most anxiety and dread and doubt because as a PhD student, there's a, a certain degree of inferiority complex that we embody. I'm just this lowly PhD student with one publication to my name and I'm gonna contact these leaders in the field so that they, they can invite me to their lab. I mean, that's a scary prospect to overcome. I went through my literature, the, the 100 or so articles that I'd saved up and I went one by one and tried to find a researcher that I thought would be a good fit. And I found about five or six that I, that I thought would be a good fit and so I decided to write them an email. Now the trick to catching people's attentions, particularly if they're really busy and they're really famous or really prominent in the field, is to have a really catchy, uh, catchy email subject line. And so even though I was a PhD student, even though I felt inferior, I thought, well, one thing that I have going for me is the Fulbright name. I, I can leverage the prestige, the weight, the notoriety of the Fulbright brand to get these people's attention. And so I just put full visiting Fulbright research student on the subject and just wrote them an email saying that, hey, I'm in the process of applying for this. I think what you're doing is interesting. Let's have a quick chat to see if there's any alignment between what you're doing and what I'm doing. And I might potentially come and visit your lab. I contacted like six or seven people, about three people, four people got back to me. And I uh, had a Skype chat with uh, one person. And I realized that this person wasn't actually a good fit. They focused for their research didn't perfectly align with what I was doing. And so I felt like I was back at square one. But I wasn't in, I wasn't in square one, I was in square two. I learned a, quite a lot from the process of contacting these different researchers and even having that interview. So I decided to go back to the literature and then just serendipitously I came across a paper on bioelectricity. And I was like, bioelectricity? That's a cool term. As I began reading the paper, I just got really excited because this paper, what they, what they had done was that chopped off the limb of a frog that couldn't regenerate once it was an adult. And by controlling the electrical gradient on that limb, on the, on the way amputation had occurred, they were able to induce regeneration in that limb. It really excited me because it showed me that my work, which was looking at how sodium ions control tissue development fit perfectly with this and that, they, that this was the field that I was going to get into, that bioelectricity was what I was interested in. So I scrolled up to see who actually published this paper and whose lab it came from. And it was a researcher called Michael Levin. And as I began looking for more papers with this term bioelectricity and tissue engineering, the same name kept popping up, Michael Levin, Michael Levin, Michael Levin, Michael Levin. And I thought, oh, this guy is a big player in the field. He's right at the tip of the field and he's pushing it. 
And so this is the guy that I want to work with. I found out that Michael is from Tufts University, so I did what I should do, go on Google and write Michael Levin Tufts University. And I read his lab's profile and what the research interest was, and it was perfectly aligned with what I wanted to do. And so I sent him an email saying, hey, I'm in the process of applying for the Fulbright, I'd like to do this with you, let me know if you're interested. And he sent me an email back, hey, this sounds really interesting, send me a CV and send me a, a, a more detailed project proposal. I sent him the project proposal, we had a Skype call, he seemed keen on the project, he thought it was innovative, he thought it was interesting and it was at the heart of what they were trying to research. And he, was, he even offered to look at my project statement for the Fulbright once I had completed that. Once I ticked that off, I was quite relieved. I felt like the hardest part for the year 2019 application was just done. The rest was familiar. I think collectively, I probably put over 150 hours this time, spread over five months, starting from February and submitting at mid-July. And I felt like the quality of my application was significantly better than the application that I put in in 2018. And so I expected and I was confident with every fiber of my being that I was going to get an, I was going to get a, uh, an, an interview for, for, for this round. And so I was expecting a call from the Fulbright early September, late August. 14 days out, no email, no phone call. 10 days out, no email, no phone call. Seven days out, no email, no phone call. At this stage, I'm worried now because I feel like, have they forgotten about me? Like, was I just not good enough and they just forgot to email me and tell me that I didn't make it? I gave them a call that morning and they just said, look, we've just had an unprecedented number of people applying this year and there's no way that we could have gotten to the applicants two weeks in advance letting them know that that they got an interview. She told me that I should just hold on tight and look out for an email and they'll tell me whether I got it or not. I was sitting there in the office looking at Alex and feeling quite doubtful and dreadful because I was like, even though I put an ungodly amount of effort towards this application in, in this year, maybe it wasn't enough. Maybe people were more talented, more skilled, and maybe they put in more work than I did. And though I thought my application was great, it just didn't cut it. Later that day, I got an email from the Fulbright, started off saying, Hamid, dear Hamid, though meritorious, um, your application was un unsuccessful in the first round of the interviews. My heart just sank. I was so confident I was going to get it, and here it was, another email, a second time around saying that I wasn't going to I wasn't going to get the scholarship, that I hadn't even made it to the interview stage. But luckily, I kept reading and I said, however, you may have made it to the second round of interviews, so just watch out for our email over the next week and I'll let you know if you've made it to the interviews. The following week, I'm driving to uni, park my car, I get out, and then I get a call from the Fulbright. And I've actually saved their phone number so I know it's them and I know that I've gotten the interview. I pick up, the lady says, hey, congratulations, you've made it to the interview stage. It's gonna be held in Canberra. You can do it either, either through Skype or in person. And I said, I'm definitely gonna come in person. With opportunities like this, you wanna show them that you're willing to go that extra mile and you're willing to do what's not only what's required, but you're willing to go above and beyond. And I wanted to be there in person so that they could feel my energy, I could shake their hands, I could, they could be in my presence, I could be in their presence. And so I began preparing again. This time around, I already had the experience and the confidence from last time around, so I wasn't too worried. I printed out my questions, and rather than writing out full answers, I put dot points, and I was very careful not to over-rehearse. I had to constantly remind myself that I want to be genuine, I want to be sincere, I want to be myself. I don't want to come across as rehearsed and robotic. I began doing mock interviews with my friends and I really worked on that aspect of being genuine and sincere. And I also worked on being more succinct and to the point and focused in my responses. Kyle, my friend who is um, just a hustler who's got his own tutoring company and a businessman and a PhD candidate. He gave me this tip. He's like, man, just structure your 
your answers so that the most important point comes right at the front and number your responses. You know, why are you the best fit for the full ride? I'm the best fit for the full ride because of one, two, three reasons. Keep it nice and focused. And this was my game plan going into the interview. The interview was on the 27th, it was a Friday, and I decided to make my way to Canberra on the 26th on that Thursday afternoon. I remember seeing Xavier, my friend, on the way out, and he asked me how I felt. And I told him I'm just peaceful, I'm calm, I'm confident, I'm collected. I'm not nervous, I've done this before. This is, I'm gonna go there and show them that I'm the right person and that they should invest in me. Driving up to Canberra, that was my mantra, that I'm the right person and I'm gonna make them see it. I'm the right person, I'm gonna make them see it. When I arrived at my Airbnb, my, my focus was to prepare my mind, to visualize, to meditate, and to practice my responses, and to make sure again that I, no matter what questions they ask me, I reminded myself that I'm an ambassador, I'm a passionate educator who wants to give back, I'm an innovative scientist, and I'm gonna show them. And as long as I can be genuine and sincere that no matter what the question is, I'm gonna be fine. Okay, so I've arrived at my Airbnb. Um, um, I think I've prepared really well. I've had friends that give me good feedback uh, and teachers that have guided me. So um, no matter what happens tomorrow, I'm gonna feel good. Oh, I gotta visualize, visualize. And so that night, I was sitting there visualizing how the interview was gonna go, visualizing being asked hard questions and visualizing myself rising to the occasion and showing them those qualities that, that I thought aligned really well with the full vibe brand. The next morning I wake up refreshed in my suit and again, I'm managing my thoughts. Oh. Okay, so it's the morning of the interview. As you can see, I'm in my suit now. Oh shit. Uh, um, I, slept really, I slept really well. I think that in the case that I've been pretty prepared and I'm good. I, did, I still have a bit of doubt. Some thoughts in my head that come and go. Like, oh, you didn't rehearse enough. But I think those thoughts need to shut up. Because I don't want to ever rehearse. I've done plenty. I know what my story is. I know what I'm going to say. Uh, and I just got to be... What I, what I don't want to be is robotic and just spout out things that I've drilled. What I want to be is a person who has particular values. And those values reflect what the Fulbright values. I'm an ambassador. I'm a passionate educator. I'm a, a, a scientist that wants to make uh, a meaningful contribution and advance my field. Um, and so I'm going to show them that. No matter what question they ask, that's what I'm going to show them. But just have fun. I think that's all I'm going to do. Just be myself, have fun, um, and not worry. I want to create a state of mind that is going to be the most creative, the most adaptive, the most agile, the most flexible, the most cheerful, the most confident. And so I'm building myself up and, and, and pointing out to myself, this, this is the quality that I have. This is why you're going to kill it. This is why you're going to get the Fulbright scholarship. This is why you're going to have a good time. I drive up to the headquarters of the Fulbright I pull out my laptop and I go through my application once more and I read it in detail. I walk up to the, to the building. So I'm here about to go in. I'm a little bit early, um, so we'll see what happens. I'm really excited. I think it's gonna be good. I go inside, okay. Okay. I sit down. The director of the Fulbright program comes out, shakes my hand, thanks me for coming in again. I go in and I shake everyone's hand. I'm calm, I'm collected, I'm peaceful. I sit down and the first panel member is introduced to me as someone who works at Questacon. And I remember Alex telling me that, hey, you should tell them that you're going to Questacon. And so as soon as he says he works for Questacon, I say, hey, I'm actually going to Questacon. And he's like, oh, why is that? I was like, I haven't actually been to Questacon and I've driven here for three and a half hours. So I'm definitely gonna capitalize on the opportunity. 
And I really, with this, I wanted to show them that I'm someone who will maximize the experience, get the most out of the opportunity. And that if I go to the, to the US, that that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna lay around in my bed and waste my life, but I'm gonna go there and experience everything to the fullest. And if you're wondering how the interview went and how I felt, <laughs> you should check out this video. I just did that. I think I did pretty good. I think I got this. I think I killed it! I killed it! I think so. Ah! Ah! <laughs> okay. I shouldn't celebrate so early because last time I felt like fantastic. Um, and it's going to be great. It's, it's going to be great. I think I'm going to get this. I'm really confident about this, even though I was confident last time. Ah! Oh. Beautiful. So driving back home was, was quite peaceful. I was proud of myself and the, and, and the way I approached this challenge and this, this, this um, opportunity. They told me that I would find out within a week whether I got the scholarship or not. I'm sitting in the room, in my brother's room, I'm helping him fix his, uh, fix the TV, and then I get a call from the Fulbright. Hi, it's Lauren from Fulbright, how are you? Hey Lauren, how are you going? Yeah, good, good. Um, look, I just, um, we're just going through um, the application, um, and I've just got one final question for you before we, um, um, and I know, <laughs> I know what this means. I know that I've secured it. I was just wondering if you'd be interested in moving to the US next year because you've been successful in the award. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much, Lauren. <laughs> you haven't just made my day. I think you've made my year. This is, this is well, spectacular. Well, I just made your future because you got the future award. Ah. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Okay, that's a lot to take in. You did an incredibly wonderful job of both your application and your interview with Stella, so huge congratulations to you. Know that, I know that this was your, your second round of um, yeah. applications, but know that the panel was really, really excited about how you went about your interview and, and they all mentioned that you'd come so far in the, in the 12 months. Awesome. Really, really big feather in your cap and a yeah. lovely pat on the back. So thank you so make much. Make the most of it, and we're yeah. really excited to have you on board. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. All right. You have an awesome afternoon. You too. I'll, I'll definitely will. Thank you. See <laughs> you okay. later. Bye. -bye. It's a reminder that if I just put in the work, and if I obsess about what I want to accomplish and I just keep focused and I visualize and I remind myself on a daily basis that today is the day that I'm gonna get the Fulbright scholarship because today I'm gonna put five hours towards it. That if I do that with anything, I can, there's nothing I can't accomplish. And if I fail, I'm gonna learn and next time I'm gonna get up and do a better job at it, which is what happened. And I'm also very happy and appreciative of the support that I received from my family, um, my friends who, helped me draft and redraft and give me feedback, who helped me prepare for the interview, and my teachers like Mark Jones and James Ivanatakis who, who encouraged me to go and, and try it again when I had all, almost lost hope. So without these guys, I wouldn't be here. And really this isn't a scholarship that I got, it's a scholarship that we all got. This is one that belongs to the community that, that surrounds me and that enables me to do things like this. I guess the key takeaway from my story is that just because you fail once doesn't mean that you're a failure. You should get up and try again and implement the, the lessons that you've learned in that first attempt to do a better job the second attempt. The second thing is you have to constantly fixate on your goals. Constantly remind yourself what your purpose is every day and your purpose is to achieve that goal and how you're going to achieve that goal. Third thing is when you're full of doubt and dread and anxiety, put in the work and you'll find that that work will actually remove the doubt. And the fourth thing is have a good community around you. Make sure you create a strong community around you that can support you just as much as you can support them. 
Without the community around me, I wouldn't be here. There you go.